Do you enjoy hiking, but have trouble taking your boots off afterwards? Do you have piles of wood and tools, and need some ideas for putting them together? I made a boot jack for my parents, and in this video I'm going to run through how. Welcome to Lawrence Plays with Power Tools. I started off with a rough sketch of the shape I was going for, and a general idea of the size. The gap between the forks needs to be wide enough to get the back of your boot into, and the overall length long enough to pivot upwards and give you somewhere to put your other foot for stability. Once I had my general ideas, I started sketching onto the wood. The straight lines were easy enough to measure and design, but for the curves, I needed a template of some sort. There's no way I'd be able to cut a curve accurately enough with a jigsaw, so I poked around the house for a bit until I found this jar lid from some herbs that was a good size. For simplicity and consistency, I used this both for the ends of the forks and the corners for the back. I wanted the back to mostly be straight for added stability when using it, although I suspect it doesn't actually matter too much. Once I had the basic shape drawn, I cut it out roughly with the jigsaw, making sure to stay well outside the lines. I don't trust jigsaw blades not to flex, especially when used with thicker planks like this one, so I wanted to make sure there was a safety margin. The concave part was much fiddlier to cut, so I switched to a narrower blade to allow me to cut the bottom of the curve more easily. With the difficult end done, I quickly trimmed the sides down to give me the taper I wanted, and yes, the vibration of the jigsaw was enough to move the camera quite a bit. Next I took the excess off the rear corners. This gave me the basic shape I wanted. Cleaning up the straight edges was pretty easy. I took a piece of MDF with a known straight edge, um, although this straight edge is starting to get a little bit worn, and used double sided tape to hold it against my pencil marks, using my clamps to squeeze the pieces together. Once again, going up to external convex corners is easy, and there's no risk of missing, so I quickly cut the straight edges to their final size using a templating bit on my router. I've been using these for a while now, but I still think they're really neat, and I've picked up some slightly longer ones for thicker wood like this. Templating bits have a bearing above the cutting blade, so they can run along a template, cutting the material underneath to the exact same shape as the template, which in this case is a straight line. Ideally, I'd probably use a table saw or a band saw for this, but I don't have the space for tools of that sort of size, so this was nice and easy, and it left a pretty smooth finish. Next up is to pull the template off and repeat it for the other side. Easy. Now that I've done the two easy cuts, I need to think about what to do next. I've still got that jar lid, but I can't slide the router about on top of it, that would be silly. Still, it is the right size, and it's what I've based the design around. My solution was to tape it securely to another piece of scrap MDF, and then clamp that to the workbench with the lid on the lower side. This gave me a flat surface on top to rest the router on, and I could use a flush trim bit to cut the MDF down to match the lid. A flush trim bit is essentially an upside down templating bit. The bearing is on the end, so you can cut the piece on top to match the piece underneath, like this. Then I peel the lid off again, and there we go, a reasonably nice curve on the end. This wasn't quite good enough, but I grabbed a knife and some sandpaper and cleaned the rough edges up, apparently off camera, sorry, <laughs> uh, giving me the template I needed. Now I had the template for the curves, I could line it up carefully with my pencil lines and the straight edge I'd already cut, and clamp it in place. Since I'm not running the router along the whole length of where the template and work meet, I don't need to use tape, the clamp will be fine. Back to the templating bit, and I can cut round the curve on the end of the fork. I have to be very careful here because the template curves around further than the fork does as I show in this diagram, so I need to make sure that I don't cut this bit here. Still, this isn't too hard, and the template allows me to easily get the rest of the curve spot on. Then I can just flip the piece over and repeat the process on the other fork. That's two corners done. The back corners are very similar. Again, clamp the template in place and cut round it, being very careful not to cut too far and get the straight edge at the back. 
At some point, I want to get a friend with a 3D printer to make me some better templates. However, that still wouldn't have helped with the funny angles in this design, unless I had them made very specifically for this job. The next part of the shape is going to be much more difficult. Here I'm working on the internal curve and edges, which means that it's much easier to go wrong, so I need to be extra careful. This is why I've left this part until last. I spent a significant amount of time trying to work out how I was going to get these cuts, until I remember that I have the shape templating um, thing. It's designed to be pressed up against any weird shape and to replicate that both in positive and negative to allow you to transfer it. It seemed perfect, so I pressed the jar lid into it, and after a little bit of trial and error, I got a nice, reasonably round representation of it. With that locked in place, I could clamp it to the side of my template, clamp the whole assembly to the workbench, and then run the router and flush trim bit around inside it to make another curve on the template. This took a few passes and a little clean-up with the knife and sandpaper, but it gave me a template with both convex and concave curves. I put the template onto the workpiece to check that it fitted reasonably well, and then drew a new line following it round. I could then redraw the straight edges from the bottom of the dip out to the forks to make sure they were tangential to both curves. Now it's time for the next cut. I tried clamping it in place, but the clamps got in the way of the router, so more tape it was. This one is actually quite safe, as the template completely covers the wood that I want to keep. I'm down to the last two cuts. These are another pair of straight lines to join the curves together, and I need to be careful at the bottom end of each one to make sure I don't damage that lovely concave curve I just made. I stick the straight edge into place and run the router very carefully along. With a router, the blade spins in a clockwise direction if you're looking down on it, so you should always cut from left to right as I'm doing here. This means that if the router catches on the wood, it pushes it back away from the cut rather than further into it, and it also means that the cutting motion pulls the router up against the template rather than away from it. I believe it's also better for preventing tear out. This is why I've positioned the wood like this. It means that my first cut goes from the difficult end towards the easy one, making it much easier to cut accurately. For this reason, once I finish the first cut, I probably should have switched to flip the workpiece over, essentially allowing me to make the same cut again, rather than cutting it in the same position. However, I was careful and it turned out okay. <laughs> now I've got the basic shape finished. I gave the whole thing a quick once over with some 100 grit sandpaper to remove any significant bumps or roughness, and then went back to the router. I wanted to round the edges over to make the piece nicer to handle and to look good, but I also didn't want to round over the edge that's supposed to grab the boot, because I thought that would make it a bit less grabby. So I just ran round the rest of it with a round over bit. This meant that at this point I had to choose which was going to be the top and the bottom, but this was quite easy as one side of the wood was a bit nicer than the other. This went well, although the oak picked up a bit of scorching from the router. Does this mean I need fancier, more expensive router bits when I'm working with hardwood? At this point, I thought it'd be nice to put some grooves in the top side to make it slightly more grippy for the other foot, so I measured and marked some lines across every centimetre along the back. Then I clamped the straight edge along a line and ran the router across with a pointy bit to cut the groove. Again, this scorched the wood a lot more than I would have liked. In hindsight, I think the grooves were also deeper than I intended, but the wood is thick enough that it doesn't really matter. It's not made the boot jack weak, but I think it would have looked better if they'd been thinner, shallower and closer together. Sorry Mum. For the final line, I no I'd noticed the scorching, so I tried running the router a bit more slowly, which I think helped a little bit, uh, but not enough that I wouldn't need to sand it to clean it up. Now it was time to start the sanding, every woodworker's favourite task. The random orbit sander is good for the big flat areas, although I often wish it was a little bit more effective. Even with 60 grit sandpaper, it doesn't remove as much material as I expect it to. Perhaps I need a belt sander. When going over angles and corners like this, however, I have to be quite careful and gentle to make sure it doesn't remove too much material. It also jumps around a lot, although with a bit of practice I realised that if you held the right part of the sander against the piece, it was much easier to keep it stable. This worked really well for removing the scorch marks though, and allowed me to make the flat surfaces feel nice and smooth. However, the edges were a lot more difficult. 
speaking of difficult, cleaning the scorch marks out of the groove was also quite difficult. Obviously the powered sander didn't fit in, so I wrapped a sanding pad around one of the wood offcuts and ran it back and forth in the grooves. This worked just about well enough, although there was still a little discoloration in the, in the grooves. Now that I reckon I've finally finished the shape, I went over it again with a sander to clean up after making the grooves and then gently broke the edges of the grabby bit with sandpaper by hand to make it a little softer and to hopefully stop it damaging the boots when it's used. I also tried to smooth the edges a bit by hand since the random orbit sander was making it awkward. I've been saying the basic shape is finished but that's not actually true. The boot jack also needs a piece underneath it to act as a pivot otherwise you wouldn't be able to get the back of the boot underneath it. So. I cut off a small piece of one of the offcuts, routed it straight, and then used the roundover bit to shape it. Then of course, I sanded it further to smooth it off. This part was very difficult, as using a handheld sander tends to lead to a more rounded over shape than I'd wanted, as this diagram kind of shows. Ideally, I'd have a mounted belt sander to make it easier to sand orthogonally, but, but for now this will have to do. I also wanted to add a cord to allow the boot jack to be hung from a hook when it's not in use, so I measured the centre line and drilled a hole through, then countersunk it. Now I think we've finally finished with all the shaping and design work on the main part, it's time to take the sanding up a gear, or at least up a grit level. I went over it with 40 to start with, then 80, 120, and now it was relatively smooth, at least, you know, for something that's intended to be a bit rustic. I glued the pivot onto the bottom and clamped it in place. I've seen suggestions on other videos for using straws to scoop out excess glue, but as I didn't have any, I tried with a folded piece of paper, which worked well too. I was considering screwing the pivot down as well to ensure it wouldn't break off, but I think actually the glue is more than strong enough. Worst case, I can always screw it down later. At this point, I had to call it a day because the glue needed some time to dry, so I stuck the assembled piece in a corner and forgot about it for a bit. The next day, I took a look at it and realised that whilst the rounded edges on the pivot meant it rested fairly nicely on the floor, it looked a bit odd, so I placed some sandpaper on a flat surface and rubbed the pivot along it to flatten it so it would rest more nicely on the floor. This was actually easier than I expected it to be. I think the construction is now complete, so it's time to add some finish. I want this to be nice and tough because I expect it to take a bit of a beating in normal use, so I applied a generous coat of varnish, which also gave it a nice darker orange hue. Once that had dried, I flipped it over and varnished the underside as well. As I said, I want this to be tough and robust, and I think I might have put a bit too much varnish on it in one coat, so I sanded it again at 600 grit and then resprayed it. This time, I think the varnish went on a bit more evenly. The final touch was to run a piece of leather cord through the hole and tie it in a loop so it can be hung on a wall. I'm pleased with how this has turned out. Unlike one of my earlier projects, uh, which I haven't made the videos for yet, <laughs> this one was appropriate for my skill level and I had most of the tools I needed, or at least was able to compensate reasonably well. I've now handed the present over, which means we can see it working, and I can now make this video without it being a spoiler. As you can see, it works as intended and seems to be quite helpful. Now that's finished, I need to decide what to make next. I do have a couple of ideas, but I'd like the weather to get a little bit warmer first. So, thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe so you can see my next project. I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.